my name is uh, Arnaldo Melo. I work for Red Hat since forever, and I maintain the Linux Perf tool, the, the user space tool inside, uh, almost for more than a decade or so. Today I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, some of the experiences that I had over the years uh, with observability tools, uh, what made me have interest in these and how it progressed over time. Uh, so, uh, it's mostly about type information uh, uh, for us to be able to look at types used in the kernel, types used in programs, used in space, uh, details about the, the, those types uh, uh, that can help us make optimizations and uh, reduce cache pressure, things like that, like uh, uh, optimization at a very low level. And also introspection in the sense that uh, Linux itself, uh, it's able to look at it. Uh, 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 Linux can look at itself and make decisions based on this. It's not just like uh, tooling that uh, humans use to see how Linux looks like or all the tools look, or all the programs look like. It's about the kernel itself using this type of information uh, to make decisions and and, uh, and 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 things like that. And adaptation as well because. Uh, Nowadays, people don't want to be replacing kernels all the time. They, they, they don't want to rebuild a kernel just to adapt to some situation. It's not like you can have some defines and then in that situation, you define that thing, rebuild it, and, and, and ship to thousands of machines. Uh, we want to be able to produce something, some, some code, and this code will be built somehow, and they're going to send it to lots of machines that run in different kernels and this code we will still work. It will adapt to what's available in that specific machine, that specific kernel. So I, it started a long time ago. Linux uh, 2.4, I was trying to understand networking, I was working with lots of legacy protocols. And then I, I, I noticed that uh, the strict SOC, that, that defines a connection, an endpoint in the Linux kernel for networking, uh, was really big. Uh, you had just one structure for, for, for a connection, and then you had this big fat union with uh, one entry per protocol that was supported by Linux. Let's say TC one for TCP, another one for UDP, another one for Apple Talk, another one for DACnet, another one for uh, each of the protocol supporters. Uh, so. Because TCP was the biggest one, uh, UDP and Unix local sockets would have a cache, uh, a, a cache impact similar to some degree to the TCP one. So it would be interesting to somehow shrink this thing. The, fir the first thing I, I, I uh, the, the the reasons for for shrinking the socket. So how to shrink this thing? You uh, you could you could move some fields around. Because when uh, you create some data structure, it has to respect alignment rules that are set by the uh, uh, specific to each of the processors. So in 64 bits, you, you do it some way. Uh, in 32 bits, it is a little bit different. There are going to be some examples that will show that. So if you move things around, you can reduce the size of data structures by uh, avoiding those alignment uh, paddings that are added if you don't uh, do it carefully. Bit fields, they are like task struct or struct sock as well, have lots of bit fields. So you had some uh, bit fields in one pl place of the struct and all the bit fields later on. So if you could move them together, then it would save uh, one by two by three bytes per, per data structure. Um, so uh, the end result of this was that uh, uh, Linux got a, a, a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, strict SOC. So instead of having just one, you have the, the strict SOC being the, what's common to all of the, the uh, protocols, and then TCP SOC for TCP, TCP SIG SOC is a, a, a specialization of TCP SOC, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's a never-ending story. I was googling to find the patch 
that I did a long time ago. And the first one that came with shrink, in shrinking uh, shrink stock was this from uh, Eric Dumazé from last year. So he was still moving things around, trying to better pack the data structure. So it's not something that you do once. There's somebody who uh, is not aware of this go there and adds a, a field that doesn't take care, and then there is a new one, and you have to, to reorganize it. Uh, and there's some more. I mean, I, I was curious if this was just a, a patch, but uh, right next to it, there was another one that was doing the same thing. Uh, but th th looking at this is tedious, so I, I was thinking, how, how can I find this information without doing manual calculations and stuff like that? Uh, I knew the GDB knows how to dump data structures and so how, how does it do, do this? So I, I, that's when I got to know Dwarf, which is uh, a funny name. Uh, it's a friend of Elf, which is the uh, uh, executable form format for, for Linux and other Unices. And more recently, we got this org as well for unwinding things in the kernel. Uh, and I created a tool called PA hole for uh, looking at struct holes, uh, structure alignment holes uh, to help uh, doing this. So it guesses this debug information that GDB puts there uh, when you compile with dash G. And uh, it can reconstruct the source code from, from that, but while reconstructing the source code, it adds all sorts of information for you to under better understand how the layout of the data structure is. So uh, this is an example. So you, you use PA hole, you say what is the data structure, the class, and then what is the binary. And then it will reconstruct it and say that 16 bytes, the offsets here, number of cache lines, number of members, etc. This is a very simple data structure. There will be some others later on. And then uh, when I first posted this, uh, there was a, a response from someone at the Atlas project at CERN that said that, oh, yeah, uh, I, I, I loved it, but uh, it's only for C because I was doing it for the Linux kernel. And uh, we have a code base, which is C++ based. It's written in C++. And, and, and Dwarf? has uh, provisions to represent many languages, not just C. So I, he, he asked if it would be possible to support C++ as well, and I say yes. And uh, I did some changes, and the biggest problem that they had was that they had this lots of machines which were 32 bits, they had optimized it for the cluster, and then they were updating at the time to x86-64, which was new. And, uh, and, and, and when that happened, you get things like this. Uh, this IO file is the file, uh, uh, a structure that is used with FOPEN, FCLOSE, FWRITE. And uh, it was designed in the 32-bit time, uh, when 32-bit was the biggest I mean, the machine. So it has these flags, which is four bytes, and then a pointer. In 32 bits, a pointer is four bytes as well. So there would be no alignment hole here. But when, this is for 64 bits. So uh, out, of, out of the blue, you get this uh, four bytes that's not used for anything. So uh, if, you, if you need to add something else to the file, the structure, let's say, or, or the structure with the same uh, layout, you can use these four bytes here that's unused and it's consuming space. Uh, and, uh, but then just looking at it and, uh, and, 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 and deciding what to do was tedious as well. So there is this dash dash reorganize that will uh, move things around and remove those, the, those things and pack the, the, the data structure. It, you, it, there's, there's this option, show reorg steps, that we'll, sh we'll, we'll, do, we'll move something, we'll tell what it did, and then show the data structure. Then do something else, tell, tell us what it did, and, and, and show the data structure until the end. Uh, so this is an example of trying to reorganize a task struct, which is, I think, is the most important data structure in the Linux kernel, uh, uh, and has lots of information here about uh, this. Uh, uh, so the reorganization saved 136 bytes, and, two, and, and the test task struct became two uh, cache lines smaller. A task struct cannot be uh, reorganized this way because there are 
lots of uh, explicit alignment that decisions so that you can avoid things like false sharing and you want to have uh, some fields close together because they are accessed in, in uh, temporality uh, 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 near. Uh, but, but you can see what kind of for, uh, extra information it, it provides. Um, so, then P-hole was just for, for um, Dwarf, okay, that's what we had in Linux. But then Dave Miller said that he, he works on Spark Linux and he wanted, uh, he knew that uh, Solaris had uh, D-Trace and D-Trace had this thing called uh, TTF, which is compact uh, C type format. So, Dwarf is too big. Uh, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but they came up with the CTF for the trace on Solaris, and uh, in the kernel image, you had all the types that that uh, are used on the and that the trace could use to 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 create the, the scripts and uh, access the kernel data structure for introspection. So. He suggested that I would support this and provide me some definitions about some, some header files that he managed to, to craft. And then I, I worked on, on P-Hole and made it be uh, uh, multi-format. So the core of it that does the printing and the reorganization, things like that, uh, now is not dwarf specific. It, it can, uh, it, it, at, um, at that point, it supported CTF and dwarf. So, First, there was this CTF reader to, to read the, the Solaris kernel and dump the, the, the types in there in the same fashion as it does with Dwarf, same code. And I wrote an encoder so that I could test the reader uh, with something else than that specific kernel. Uh, so with this, the PHO uh, had the, 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 a converter. It could convert from one type, dwarf, to another type, CTF. Uh, just for testing. Uh, and, and it was not sophisticated. And, uh, nowadays, there is libctf that came from Solaris, and uh, uh, PHO doesn't support this yet, but may, may, may well do this in the future. So, dwarf problems is that uh, the kernel community had problems with dwarf at some point. That, uh, an, an attempt was made at uh, having a unwinder based on dwarf information on uh, call frames, and there was problems. There were the quality that the, the compiler generated uh, the information led to bugs, etc. And people, and Linux just threw it away the, and and went back to the f frame pointer based one. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, in, in the kernel have t tens of thousands of obje object files. And, and dwarf, it, it, this, it, for each of the object files in isolation, it has a representation for all the types that are used in that specific object file. Uh, so, uh, so lots of duplication for f types that are really big, like task struct. So the debugging for files, uh, as a result, uh, are very big, and, and you have to install like a, a, a was it updating my machine yesterday? It was something like. Uh, 76 megabytes just the, the package, and uh, it, it's, it's really big. Uh, nowadays, there are, there are provisions. So dwarf, uh, at that time, it was Dwarf 3, 3. Now it's Dwarf 5. Dwarf 5 has ways for you to compact things. But then, um, as we will see, it seems to be too late, at least for the things that I'm talking about now. Uh, so then, at some point after this, BPF is typing. Uh, uh, BPF did this. To, for many things, and now it's used for many things. But let's say, to, to, pr to pretty print maps, you, you don't want to have one program per map that understands what's the layout for each of the keys or each of the, 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 the data entries in each of the uh, entries of the map. And later for compile once, run everywhere, which is the topic for many uh, presentations. I, I, I will only provide a link at the end. <laughs> But it's really interesting, this thing, for adaptability. It basically, you, you create a, a BPF program, and, and it, in a way that it records where some data structures that the, the kernel has are accessed. And then when you are going to load, it will look at the, 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 the BTF information for the kernel, 
and for the BTF information for this BPF program. And we'll do adaptations so that uh, if some field moved uh, offset, off the offset change and some other possible uh, uh, modifications, the BPF program will still run on this uh, different kernel than the one that it was compiled uh, and tested originally. Uh, so th from this, it came BTF, which is uh, BPF type format. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, it reused uh, uh, the parts of the CTF encoder and decoder. No, not a decoder, the encoder, the, 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 the encoder, because the, the first producer of, of BTF information uh, was the uh, Clang and Pierhold. Clang generate B, uh, BTF, but for BPF for the BPF target, for BPF programs. And P-Hole is used to convert from dwarf to BTF using libpf to do the duplication of, of all those duplicate types. Um, BTF, BPF deduplication, it looks at all the objects and removes type uh, duplicates. There are several things that, uh, that, that can happen. In the current, sometimes there are two different types with the same name in different object, and so th there are provisions to, to deal with that. And then I uh, the, the first B BTF reader was the kernel verifier. The, the kernel verifier would, you, you would associate BTF information with a BPF ROM that you just loaded, so that the ver verifier could later on use these for uh, its decisions. And uh, in doing so, uh, oh, the, the, the kernel verifier would verify BTF information. It would look at BTF to see if it, it, it's valid. But if, in, uh, this information in the end, when you boot the machine, is in the syskernel BTF VM Linux file in CSFS. Uh, so, where libbpf and other customers can, can, can access it per, per, and, and, and get the information for, for all the types in the Linux kernel. This file nowadays is about three megabytes. Uh, there were, uh, over, over the last three or four years, some new features were added that, that made it a little bit bigger over time, but it's on uh, the ballpark of three, three megabytes. So processing it is really fast. It's in kernel memory, so it's really fast. So instead of P-hole using Dwarf, which is big, it, well, the interesting thing is that now you can use this file, and then you don't have to specify anymore where to get. If you don't say where to get informa type information from, it will try here. Uh, so you, you, now you do something like this. Uh, pay hold spin lock T, and it will say that it's a type def struct spin lock spin lock T. That, that's what spin lock T is. So if you do like P hold spin lock, just this, uh, it will use that file and we'll expand it like this. So it's an union that there is this thing in here. But what's this? So you can do things like this, expand it. You ask phold dash capital E, spin lock, and it will expand everything. And uh, it, it, you should try this on task struct. It, it, it doesn't crash, it works, but it will produce a really large file. And it's interesting in a sense because uh, people started using these of these offsets that are related to the start of here in, in crash analysis. When you get a nopes and then you look at it, oh, there is the, a, 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 a nude reference and the offset of the instruction is 158 hexadecimal. Then you get the, you, and you think, that, oh, that's that data structure. What is in that offset? So you can expand the type, ask for those offsets to be printed in hexadecimal, which is possible as well, and then you get to the offset from the, that you got on the faulting instruction. Well, where is it? Uh, it, 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 it is on ELF sections, just like uh, Dwarf is, and it is as well in that uh, CSFS. So if you get a kernel, uh, with a BTF session, you can use it, let's say, for a kernel different from the one that you are running now. And then you want to, to compare the types on that, on the running kernel against this other kernel. You can do that, producing the output for both and doing a diff, let's say. Uh, and 
As well, you can, for a loaded BPF program, you can ask the kernel, say, give me the BTF information for this program, and, and it will pro provide you. This is useful for things like uh, uh, profilers, like perf, uh, to get BTF information, where it will get, uh, 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 besides the, the, the type information, BTF has an extra section that where you can get line information, uh, line information, like, like to do uh, disassembly, and Perf uses this for doing uh, annotation, live annotation or annotation. Um, so, and, it, and there is BPF2, uh, which is the canonical tool for you to deal with BPF, uh, what's running on the system, pinning programs to some specific location on BPFFS, uh, asking all kinds of information. One, one thing that you can do with BPF2 is, is use the subcommand BTF. Another, you go on the comments, uh, and you ask uh, to get that file, the, the CFS VM Linux, and, and produce C that you can uh, include in your BPF programs to access the data structure in that specific kernel. So it reconstructs. And, and you can do the same thing with PA hole. The PA hole dash dash compile and will reconstruct compilable source code like BPF2. That's another thing you can do. Uh, where else? In, in syskernel BTF, besides VM Linux, you have one file per kernel module. In this file uh, are the types that are not present in VM Linux and are specific to this uh, kernel module. Uh, program lines, as I said, you have a, a, a BTF X here left section, and Perf Notate uses it. Let, let, let's see here. So. But uh, I will talk about a, an adaptability use case for a tool that was recently introduced in Perf, and uh, we will see uh, the, an example of getting the source code for a BPF program that is loaded. So Nam Young King uh, 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 wrote a, a... In Perf now, you, uh, we are implementing new features. Uh, instead of changing the kernel to provide some new facility, we we use BPF to uh, hook into some strategic places, gather some information, do in place, uh, do uh, bucketization, aggregation in, in, in BPF maps, and then use a space, it, it, the, perf, the, the existing perf infrastructure uh, sees all these as a new synthetic event, uh, so something that uh, gets all this aggregation and then you get it there. And uh, you can consume it like CPU cycles or, s or some other uh, trace point or whatever. Uh, but but then, then while writing this, he realized that uh, to support multiple kernels, uh, there was this change in the SCAD switch trace point that now has a prep state, a new argument for this uh, uh, trace point. So there are kernels where we don't have that, and there are kernels where we have that. So how, how can I write a tool, in this case perf, that will use this information when available, and when not available, we will use another method to get the same information, perhaps a more costly uh, method. So uh, what he did was um, this. In, in, the, in, the, in the perf loader, in, in perf you, you have to get the, the bytecode for this skeleton, let's say, and, and load into, into the kernel. Perf will call libbpf to say, insert the, the, put this BPF program in place, set up its maps, and et cetera, et cetera. And libbpf will do all this for, for Perf. Uh, in the process of doing so, it will create a BPF skeleton in, in a previous state. And then after this skeleton is in place, done by libbpf, you can go and say, uh, uh, please give me the BTF information for this skeleton uh, and uh, find uh, this type def, a BPF3 sketch switch. And then you say, uh, you get the type of it, and then at the end you say, oh, is this a function prototype? Oh, yes, it is a function prototype for a, a, a trace point. And then you can ask, how many arguments 
does this uh, trace point has in this specific kernel that's being used at the moment. VLAN, it's generic because it's the same thing for, let's say, how many entries, how many entries this enumeration has, or how many entries this struct has, how many members, or in the case of a function prototype, is how many uh, arguments, how many parameters. So if it's four, and then it says, oh, I have prep state, and, and it sets this in an area that uh, when the program is loaded, the BPF program is loaded, the logic can check this. And then if, if this variable in the BPF program is set to true, it will it will do this. This, this is the, the, the BPF program and that hooks into the SCAD switch at tra BTF trace point. And then it receives this context. And in this context, uh, it, it says, it has, pre it has prep state, then I can use the third argument, uh, the, the, the fourth argument yet. If not, I will have to use this BPF helper and call get task state for, for this specific thing. So if, if there are four arguments, I'm going to use this because it's already passed. If not, I will use something which is more costly. And then this program, perf, will work with this BPF-based off-CPU profiling. Uh, on systems with the two kinds of, of uh, uh, trace points. So if I, if I go and run it, I say I run it and leave it running here. Uh, uh, this control C is just later on. And then while it's running, I can use BPF2 and say, what are the programs that are running? And I know that the name of the program is on switch, and I ask for four, four lines. And then it says, oh, it's a uh, on switch, and then several informations about the, the, the BPF program. It says it was perf that put it in place, and then there are several maps that are associated with it. Uh, and then I, I can say, show me the code. And say BPF2 prog dump jitted. Uh, this BPF program is loaded as a byte code, and then the, uh, after passing verification, it, it will be jitted and transformed into native code. So this is jitted. ID 634. 634. It's this ID here. So I, then I get the, the source code. for uh, I, I get the, the uh, native instructions and then intermingle it with it, like with object dump uh, dash ds, this assembly, you get the, the program. So, so this was BPF2 asking the kernel for the source code that is associated with that specific BPF program, and it provided. So I can as well ask BPF2 map and uh, and then for the, uh, what uh, is the to get the the, the map uh, of CPU that's associated with I know that there is a map with that name. So if I do BPF2 map dump ID 490, I get uh, pretty printed because it's going to use the BTF information that's associated with this specific map. Uh, the feature that Nam Young implemented is uh, off CPU profiling. Uh, after you run that uh, perf record with the specific parameters, and then it produces a perf data file as usual, and then you call this, and then you see that this is uh, that uh, when when this program, which was a perf bench SCAD messaging, uh, a, a synthetic workload to to test some uh, messaging uh, schedule. Uh, you see that uh, when it was not running, 2% of the time it was because it was waiting for poll. And 37% uh, was write and 40% was read. And then you, you see uh, 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 that uh, the, 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 this is a backtrace, yes? This, call this, call this, call this, call this, and this, and this, and this. You, you, uh, he said that he, that he removed the, the call graph operation from this uh, here so to make it more compact. But you could see uh, what were the paths that lead to that poll in the application uh, and uh, to write as well. So this is perf annotate using the same thing. Uh, you, you, run, you run something like this, oops, uh, which is, is perf using a BPF to do something. And then if you go here and, and say perf top and ask for three counters, uh, L1 I cache load misses, ITLB load misses and cycles, you're going to see nothing. 
Oh, yeah. And then if I uh, slash. Something is wrong. Uh, but here, this BPF here, and I say annotate. I will see the, again, the source code for that uh, C's exit. It's, it's, this program is hooking on the Cisco entry path and the exit path. And then you're going to see here the, these kinds of things that uh, in the previous presentation I showed that uh, most of the, the action is happening when at entry and on a knob. That's because, uh, let me go back to the presentation. This is a presented uh, in, in plumbers in Lisbon, the, the last uh, plumbers that was uh, in, uh, in person. And uh, this, you see, uh, is similar. Uh, lots of things are happening at the beginning. But I tried the same thing again, but disabling uh, inspect and meltdown hardware mitigations. And then things look more uh, OK. So, because when you are going to, uh, to, to the kernel with the mitigations in place, it will uh, uh, flush some caches and, uh, to avoid the speculations and uh, problems. So, and uh, finally, uh, we have nowadays, BHOLI is used in the kernel build. I mean, it, it's, uh, all the kernels that are being built now that want to have uh, BPF uh, functionality, uh, we'll have to have we'll have payhole installed and use it in a step of the build process. So you you, you uh, compile everything and at some point you have to have this this, this step that will get the VM Linux producer so far. We'll do get all the dwarf information, to duplicate it and create the BTF information, link it with the kernel so that when it boots we have that CZFS uh, file in place. And it's the same thing for, for kernel modules, uh, for each of them, uh, one after the other. So, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the eventually, compilers will produce BTF for the x86, uh, for the x86 target, or for ARM, and etc. That's not the case so far. It's, they are only producing uh, BTF information for the BPF target. Uh, so, for now, PHOL is. is uh, uh, Required, but uh, even when they produce, there will be uh, the need for a step when you 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 will get all the BTF that was generated for each of the objects and the duplicated. So, p hole or other tool will have to do this step that is not a compiler. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, BTF information has uh, BTF has information for, for global variables nowadays just for per CPU global variables, which was the only use case so far that requires information about those those variables. Um, it, it's really convenient when they're developing new features. Um, uh, so if we go one new, one such new feature is this BTF tags. So Clang generates the new dwarf tags and will convert this dwarf tag uh, for this new BTF uh, uh, type of, of information. So the idea is that when you have a kernel data structure and it's marked, let's say, uh, dash underscore underscore e user or underscore underscore per CPU or, or all the annotations that you have there, this will be preserved. And then uh, when a BPF program goes to access some of these fields, the verifier has more information to decide if this is safe or how this should be done. Uh, uh, during the kernel build, because there are these new features uh, being added over time, you have these scripts PHO flags that will, in the end, produce the set of flags that can be used with the specific PHO version that is installed in this machine. And looking at it, we can see we can see several options that were implemented over 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 time. So uh, uh, the version 108, uh, 1.18 to 1.21 uh, had a problem that encoding BTF variables for the per CPU was problematic. So uh, we had this skip. 
uh, uh, then if it's more than 1.21, then we have a BTF kind float. Uh, we, we, we generate information for floating type uh, uh, variables and types because it was not being generated, but for S390, kernel uses uh, uh, flo floating type for some uh, things. Uh, and then if it's more than 1.22, we can use dash J, which is the same thing as make to, 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 to use to, to load the dwarf information in parallel. And, and, uh, and encode BTF in, in parallel as well. Uh, version 1.22 only loads in parallel, so it greatly speeds up the process, but there is an opportunity for further uh, speed ups that was implemented already, a uh, less bug was fixed uh, last week, I think. Less, no bug. Uh, and so version 1.24 that we'll release after coming back from this conference, we'll be able to uh, encode BTF in parallel as well. So the, the time it takes during the kernel build for this step to be uh, performed is, is, is being reduced. Um, one, one other tale is about Rust. Rust is being, uh, 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 Rust is, uh, people are, are working to have parts of the kernel built in Rust. And Rust has uh, different types of dwarf information, and uh, it does some interesting things like uh, this reorganized I mentioned at the beginning to make it uh, smaller, the data structure. Uh, Rust does by default. If you if you don't say anything, it will move fields around for for data structures. Uh, if you don't want it to do that, you have to specify something. You have to uh, give some attributes to the data structures so that don't do it. But since it does that, the dwarf information that's produced uh, has the the the, is the members in, in a data structure with uh, the offsets in, out of order and the kernel. Uh, when, when the kernel is validating this information, it says it's invalid. So talking with Miguel Ojeda, the, the guy who is working with Rust for the kernel, we, we decide for now to, to add this option, lang exclude, and then you can say that if the dwarf information was produced from Rust, don't encode it. Uh, because this is the first problem that we have. There may be others. So uh, we, we need some more time to, to look at this. Uh, and uh, one piece of curiosity, uh, in Dwarf, in the, 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 the first tag, there is the information about what was the language that, was, that produced this object file. And then there are many. I mean, Dwarf is really uh, has provisions to, 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 to express all the constructs that are in all those languages. There, there are many others. Uh, I put just some here. And. Uh, Finally, the, there is a, a pretty printing in the kernel. You, you can get this information that is in the kernel to, let's say, uh, print this uh, print this SKB. So you, you do something like this, and you produce something like this uh, in 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 the uh, uh, in DMASG or wherever you, you can, or in a file, or in a sec file, or things like that. So. Uh, inside the kernel, you can do it. There, there are people now who are wanting to have all the the, the global variables uh, encoded in BTF so that when you do a uh, K dump, you could have this information there and then you can uh, pretty print this while doing post mortem analysis. You can influence how this is done by using some flags to, to make it more compact or more terse. And uh, you can also in user space use phold for the pretty printing. So you say phold dash dash predify the uh, standard input and you say oh th the header is of this type so it gets this type from the kernel btf information and then you feed it some binary and then you get the it it, it gets the raw data and 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 pretty prints it uh, because it's in the kernel btf you say p hole elf 64 hdr and it will get the information for that BTF gen is uh, for older kernels where there is no uh, BTF information, so you can generate just the subset of BTF information that libbpf then can use to do compile once, run everywhere, and things like that. 
And just to, to show one, one re really recent that I'm still reading about from, from the guys behind Celio, it's a Valent. They have this Tetragon uh, that use, DTF is required because to do its magic, to look for exploits or things like that, it has to, to use BTF. So that's it, what I had to say today. There's this information about BTF the dub is really interesting, describing Core Rare, and the presentation is at this place. So, thank you. Any questions? It's not really a question, it's a, a big thanks for PA Hall because yeah. uh, I use it on a daily basis and uh, it saves me a lot of time. User land, but uh, it's, uh, it's a nice aid in parallel to GP, for example. You just dump a structure, you quickly read from a dump what it matches, etc. And uh, just using it to optimize the code all the time, uh, seeing yeah. the, um, the cache line uh, boundaries, etc. It's really a fantastic tool. Cool. I encourage everyone to use it. Yeah, cool. Nice to know. So something like the task truck has a bajillion macros uh, that are controlled by config options for what's included in there. How we, what are we doing to detect regressions for alignment for like all the different matrix of configs that adjust how it's laid out? The, the thing is, uh, uh, in, in task struct, you have, uh, or in GCC, oh, uh, you, you, you can add an attribute to a specific uh, 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 struct member. So you say, this struct, this struct has to be aligned at 64 bytes. So, so if you add anything before it, and there is a space, it continues at that alignment. And if you fill all the space here and put one more byte, then you create a 63 byte new hole. So the, the, the alignment information uh, is, is it's for there. It was not encoded in the dwarf. Now it is encoded in the dwarf. So for instance, the, the algorithm that I have for reorganizing it, the structure is not taking it into account. It should. It should take that into account and keep that there and then don't use this space. I mean, it, can, it can use this space before because it's there and then you can put, but you cannot move things that are in, inside that uh, cache line that's marked. So you, you want to say, oh, that, that cache line is, uh, it should not be messed with. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the programmer uh, uh, arranged things in a way that uh, those fields in that cache line are related. So uh, I cannot just move that thing. Thanks. For, for ABI, I think, people use this as, uh, uh, I want to add something and keep the ABI. So I get some, uh, one of those holes and put it there, but the ABI is preserved. Uh, if, if it's just a new feud. Yeah, it's nice to use a hole if there's one available, right? Yeah. Um, so since you are reorganizing the structures, is it possible that it's actually causing cache inefficiency? Yeah, yeah. Because then, then the CPU might have to access different cache lines at some point? Exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, you, I mean, if uh, I have to add something to PA whole saying, oh, if there is some uh, alignment thing inside the, the structure, just say, oh, you should uh, uh, reorganize is not something uh, that should be done with this. Uh, it requires extra care because you, you, could, you could get something that are related and that are separated. There, there is, uh, and, and move them together, and then it would even be better but than the person who originally put all this information. There, there, is, uh, there, there is more, inf uh, uh, there are resources, harder resources in uh, new processors where you can get information in, in tools like Perf to, 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 to see uh, for, uh, to, to see uh, when a cache line is being targeted by different processors, and then it's going continually evicted from the, the, the CPU cache. And then people, uh, 
uh, one dream is to get this information and then feed into the reorganization uh, algorithm so that it moves things to be better placed than before. But, but you run it first, you reorganize with profiling information, mm -hmm. it would be profiled guided data optimization and yeah. not code. That, that was my question, if you can get some sort of a heat map of these structures so you can feed it back into the um, structure yeah. reorganization. In yeah, in, in Perf we have Perf C2C, cache to cache, which produces some output and people are using it because it, it, it was available before in the HPUX uh, in the past. So people, there are some nice articles that you can use that and it, exp it exploits these uh, hardware capabilities and, and you can notice, oh, this, uh, I have a lock here uh, with a thing that is read uh, mostly and then every time I'm gonna read that thing, I have to go to memory because the lock is invalidated. So the, 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 the tool is there, but not as good as, let's say, Peter Zuster would like. He would like something like getting the output for peer hole and doing data structure annotation. Like we had perf top showing the lines of code and then you would see the data structure and then uh, look at what are, are the fields that are the most hot and uh, while doing it live. So you would see the data structure being accessed. That, that would be really nice. Uh, yep. There are several people who are trying to work on this from time to time, like Stefan Arania at Google. He has compiled people there. He keeps saying that this from time to time. Because there are some things like looking at the, looking, uh, preserving information about uh, accesses to the data structure, like BPF Core has. In BPF Core, you have to say, oh, I'm accessing this field. So it produces relocation information so, so, so that you could map back from the, from the cache line, the offset in the cache line to the data type and then to the member. Blah, blah, blah. But there, there is some difficulties in this, but uh, eventually this will come to fruition. Thanks. Would a struct group help to identify things that PA hole shouldn't, uh, well, should keep together when it's reorganizing? What? Uh, a struct group is a feature that Gustavo talked about this morning where you can say that, uh, so it's, it's for mem copy protection and mem sets initially, where yeah. you can group items together and it creates a sort of yeah, I missed that. Uh, the, how does getting, uh, does that produce uh, information that get in the debug information or is uh, just like a post-processing phase? I have to, I have to take a look at it. Yeah. I, I noticed that, but I hadn't, I, I have not investigated it. Maybe. And how does it play with um, uh, structs that get randomly reorganized? The structs that get out of memory? No, that get randomly reorganized. Do you mean uh, we're using the, uh, the ah, randomly reorganized, I understood. Um, then if you don't have the, the map to what is, is there, you will not be able to, to, to look at it. So you will not be able to. Be, uh, by design, yes, you reorganize that and, and uh, randomly and, and th that there is no mapping, it cannot do magic. Yeah, it's on. Uh, yeah, regarding your question, a struct group is not supposed to uh, uh, to modify the, the memory layout within the structure. Yeah, yeah, it's not, but I just have to I just wondered if it would provide the information, uh, well, it would allow the expected structure requirements to be defined in greater granularity in the code in a way that might appear in BTF and so PA hole could use it. It's not just to say that this part of the struct, these fields should be kept together for cache alignment reasons or whatever, for cache line. So, so I mean, from the information, you can get this info. Uh, now, there is this, this uh, 
uh, alignment information. So getting the alignment information should say, oh, this, the, 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 from this on, you should not mess with. You should keep them together or things like that. You could use this as a, as a heuristic and improve the, the way that the algorithm is doing. Uh, the, 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 the decision uh, will be by the, by the developer at the end. You should just try to ask for it to be reorganized. You get the new thing, insert, uh, replace the old one, and run your benchmark. If it gets better, don't do. That, oh, I, I, was, I think it was uh, Jesper was describing how he was, he was looking, at, has this workload and he uses perfstat and looks at how many cache misses and then he moves things around and runs it again and oh, it improved it. So these things are related. <laughs> So a kind of brute force with some uh, information that you have about that data structure. So uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of interesting ideas that you could use to do some feedback loop, run something, measure, change things around, rebuild, run again, compare with the previous one. Yeah. Automatically, in some automated way. I was just going to add that usually you just use an anonymous struct, right? If you want to group things together inside a struct, then you just put them inside an anonymous struct. Exactly. And align things. That, that's another way, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you could say the, the reorganization would be just on the top. It is just on the top level one. It doesn't mess with what is inside it. You would have to ask, reorganize that one as well. And then if there is information in PeerHold, for instance, when it prints a, a data structure, a large one, it, it, it's, it, it prints you have one struct inside another and and it looks at this previous one if it has padding and says oh the previous field has padding and perhaps you could use it um, somehow you, you mentioned the rust compiler is actually doing some of this automatically is it do is it simply just optimizing out holes or is it doing something any i don't know i haven't checked it okay. what i know is that it does something to disagree, and that this ends up producing dwarf that is out of order, the, the offsets in the data structure. And then the BTF encoder doesn't look at this and passes this on to the BTF, and then the BTF is refused by the kernel. Okay. What we will do in, in the future, if this is the only problem, or I mean, to solve this one, is when encoding BTF, put them in, or, in order, in the order that Verify expects. Because I'm not changing the offsets, I'm just ordering it in the way that the kernel BTF code uh, expects. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what this that it does to, but it, it, I know that it changes things around, uh, how and to what extent, and that you can disable these like you do with specific alignment in C. Any more questions? Well, thank you.